and she was our first person to right? But there's also a god of happiness. It's a goddess. You could give that. It's
Just a couple of things. If you want to tweet about us, you can use the hashtag Wikimedia2014. Uh, feel free to come in and out the room as you please. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce Katie Chen. Transgender female, intersex, and not gender queer. 
that compares to the 2.2 million items with the value of male or female. Now, is this number um, much lower than expected, much higher than expected? That's a difficult question to answer, but um, but this is probably the case that the number is lower than we should expect. Estimate varies with a uh, recent study giving approximately 1% of, of the world's population as suffering some degree of gender dysphoria. About one in five of which will transition from the assigned gender at some point in their life. Of course, for a lot of people who have, or for that matter, are in the process of transitioning, the gender identity history is not relevant to what makes them notable for our purposes on Wikipedia. In such cases, reliable sources we rely on should not, well, may not, include any information mentioning it, which widely translate to such information not being included on their Wikipedia or Wikipedia entries. The question arises, what do we do and what should we do when a gender non-conforming person gender identity is known to us? On the English Wikipedia entry, the most MOS identity guideline states that for terms relating to gender such as pronouns, possessive adjectives and gender nouns, which favor self-designation respecting a person's latest express gender self-identification. Quote, this applies in reference to any phase of that person's life unless the subject has indicated a preference otherwise. Direct quotation can get potentially tricky here when writing about a transgender person um, if it refers to the transition part of the line, but that can be handled on a case-by-case -case basis. Then there's the issue of article titles. Um, the or when this Wikipedia policy relevant to this is the WP common name. It tells us that the English Wikipedia prefer to use the name that is most frequently used to refer to the subject in English language reliable sources. If the name of a person changes, then more weight should be given to the name used in reliable sources published after the name change than in those before the change. These all look reasonable in theory, but how the policy and guideline play it out in practice. Generally speaking, if the subject is in the news right now, whether for the transition or for some unrelated reasons, the articles are in pretty good state. Not all of them, most of them are in pretty good state. There are exceptions though, not this one, I've kept it. The subject of an article uh, at the beginning of last year and the end of the year before that, complained about being outed by the article we have on her and requested either changes to the article or deletion of the article itself. This person is a well-regarded military historian. She is a published author and she has appeared on a number of television shows. So, as a result of that, the so the fact that she was previously known by a different name, or that she previously lived publicly as a male, cannot be seriously disputed by anyone who has seen the available reliable sources. That's not even, that fact is that not even actually disputed by the subject in question. She actually edits Wikipedia sometimes, and she took part in the various discussions around this subject. However, over multiple discussions, on a number of different pages, we had editors spending many kilobytes arguing over the reliability of the various sources on her, including a source edited by three fellows of the Royal Historical Society and published by a well-regarded academic publisher. In the name of preventing outing of this person's gender identity history without having to delete the article, we had various suggestions ranging from Having two separate articles on the same subject with one covering the period before her transition and one after, or pretending to either explicitly or implicitly that the former name was not the true. Um, so as we is she made the name. Oh, that's a writer. <laughs> In the name of applying the policy on biographical biography of living persons. The article over time was stripped of a lot of information on this person's life that 
is weapons to reliable sources and otherwise standard on the BLPs. Something like that. Um, then we have subjects that are in the news, such as Chelsea Manning. Most of you, but not all of you, know who she is. For those of you that don't, she is an American soldier that was convicted of passing on classified documents to WikiLeaks, which were then published by WikiLeaks. Her legal team announced soon after her sentencing that Manning is transgender and would thus be transitioning. The fact that Manning is transgender wasn't actually unknown before then. It was widely known within LGBT circles. It just wasn't uh, formally publicly announced by someone who Manning herself or someone to do with Manning. Um, when it was formally uh, publicly announced by the lawyers, um, the fact that she's transitioning was reported widely by the world press. Immediately after the announcement, articles on Manning um, on the various language Wikipedia were moved from the previous title to Chelsea Manning. With the gender language within the article updated to use female terms and all were well. In fact, Wikipedia were quite a pace in various media um, as being sensitive to people. Now, the speed of the change in that article title was quick. But it certainly isn't unusual if you take the transgender part of the equation. For example, uh, we have an editor here who pointed out during the discussion afterwards that um, Jimmy Wales is known to have had his hands forced over his computer during Kate Middleton's wedding so that he could move um, the article to Captain Duchess of Cambridge. Literally, as soon as the marriage was pronounced, pressed, moved. The man in page move was only controversial because transgender and because WikiLeaks. It wasn't long before various discussion took place in the various languages of Wikipedia that is resulted in the article being moved back one by one to the previous title. On the new discussion on the English Wikipedia that resulted in the article being moved back from Chelsea, various insensitive, discriminatory, and absolutely failed comments <coughs> were made about Chelsea or transgender people in general. Quote, he is a woman only in his head. Quote, one day circus did so. Um, comparison was made of transgender people to animals, and again, quote, he is mentally unstable, etc., etc., etc. As a result of the publicity surrounding this case, um, the bit uh, I showed earlier in the manual style were, that states the subject's gender identity needs to be respected were proposed to be removed completely so that people can call Chelsea by her um, previous identity. An article that those other trans people on Wikipedia received edits changing references to the subject against their present gender identity. Well, in this specific case, the article were moved back to Charles Manning a month later in a subsequent discussion. Many of the rationale were based on recent usage by popular media rather than based on human decency and dignity, or because it's the right thing to do. Using a male name to refer to a trans woman or a female name to refer to a trans man when they explicitly asked for that not to happen, is highly hurtful to the subjects, and not just to the subjects, but also trans people in general. Outside of biographies, Wikipedia coverage of transgender topics similar to other diversity topics, such as women history, leave much to be desired. Whether we are talking about medication that are commonly prescribed to a transsexual person as part of the transition, or general information on trans-related topics that someone questioning gender, of considering transitioning wants to know they are either missing, limited in content where it exists, and all badly written. Why is correcting this important? In all of this, Wikipedia is the first stop for many people looking for information. It's where they go to for information. It affects people's understanding and perception of the topic. 
so much so that I am aware of at least one gender identity clinic in this country who has provided information to their patients on the medication the patients are being prescribed with text based or copy from Wikipedia. This is the doctors providing Wikipedia stuff straight to the patients. Moving away from articles to editors, how many gender non-conforming Wikipedia editors are there? In, in the Wikimedia Foundation, April 2011 and November 2011 editor survey, the Wikimedia Foundation asked the single question of, what is your gender? And gave the option of male, female, transgender, and transsexual. Uh, in the August 2012 survey, it added the option prefer not to say. This is certainly not the worst question I've seen in surveys. Unfortunately, it's also not very good at capturing information on people's gender. Well, it can be argued that transgender is reasonably okay for catch-all terms for those whose gender identity does not fit nicely into gender bi binary. Transsexual is not a gender. For most people that is or has transitioned from one of the gender binary to the other, the answers will be male or female according to their gender identity. Transsexualism describes the condition they suffer when the gender does not match their physical body. Unfortunately, there is no one of the best practice on how to face questions to best capture the information while maintaining appropriate sensitivity. Different recommendations recommend different things, and, but they all based on the principle of separating the question on gender identity from whether it matches to a person's assigned gender at birth. If you are interested in more information on facts, this, there is a gender identity learning pattern on rhetoric here you can look at. It was started by me, but it was actually completed by Jonathan Morgan, so thanks to him. While the media movement is obviously a global one with volunteers from all different backgrounds, cultures, and beliefs, it is one that strives to be inclusive, accepting, and sensitive to people. Unfortunately, it doesn't always match that. It doesn't always achieve that. At last year with Kimania, for example, a trans participant was having a conversation with one of the many uh, lovely volunteers that were there. But the volunteer, for some reason, maybe because of the trans person voice, suddenly turned towards the trans the participant and said, Are you a boy or a girl? The question may have resulted from simple curiosity and they didn't think what they were asking. Um, However, it is very helpful for someone who's questioning their gender or worry about whether other people are accepting the gender presentation. Please don't do that. We, as a Wikimedia movement, especially those of us that organize events or work in a movement entity, need to better educate ourselves on this issue to make sure we know how to appropriately sensitive, how to be appropriately sensitive to different people's needs. To be able to educate our volunteers on how they in turn should act with sensitivities towards gender non-conforming people. Consider a fence to hosting events to improve Wikimedia project coverage of related topics like we already are doing, so increasingly successfully with gender gap outreach. Think about how we collect information such as gender of editors, volunteers of events, <coughs> participants, or whether we need to collect that information at all. And to take part in discussion on wikis whenever they arise, providing argument based on knowledge and not ignorance so that the consensus process ends up with the right results. And since I promised a discussion during my um, talk proposal, my question to you, the audience, is to what do you think, taking into consideration that um, an article subject desire for privacy, do you believe we should include information on someone's gender identity history at all? Do bear in mind that in some instances, some instances, such as the historian I mentioned earlier, the notability is, while it's unrelated to the transition, you can't actually talk about that person's life and what makes them notable unless you were to include information from the life peace transition. 
It is directly in the article of by references um, that will help the subject against their wishes. So, um, go ahead. Tom.
so that you don't get to control your article, sort of thing. Um, it's, uh, I, I think it's probably better to apologize and put my behind campaigning for it not to cause issues. Um, if you if you take the, the Chelsea Marion uh, article uh, um, as an example, I just checked the, the German Wikipedia about it. Um, um, I think, well, definitely the person itself is relevant because of what he did, uh, leaking documents and you know making it, which which had been a big uh, big thing. Still, well, considering what 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 the gender transition means, I, I think it was. Uh, there's probably the line between, well, she did it publicly and it, it got to a, a co to, into a context where it was publicly and also I think would be sort of a little hypocritical at, the, uh, at this particular example to say, well, why, why not having at least a mentioning in, in Wikipedia? I definitely think it's important to, um, and that's something else coming up from the uh, making it public, the general said this that she wants to be called Chelsea Manning. So it's her decision and I think you have to respect it in Wikipedia or everywhere else. Um, third of, so uh, but this is clearly just on this example and there's uh, I, I don't have any solution or suggestions right now on how to you you know to come up in different uh, in other situations. A third thing I just uh, want to mention is that it also should concern uh, the Wiki media movement that outing somebody's gender identity and it's difficult can also lead to a lot of problems for this person. Mm -hmm. So there needs to be a sensitive way to to uh, to think about it, especially when you uh, uh, especially when it comes down to activists which are prominent or so, but um, you know might have serious problems in their, in their home countries uh, because of uh, dangerous threats they um, Hi, I just uh, want to say, because I think we're out of time actually, and I think this is a very important discussion, and I just want to make, um, kind of put out there an invitation that anyone in this room would be welcome to come check out the Wikimedia LGBT uh, user group we have within the Wikimedia movement. So. Um, quick plug, and I, I don't mean to take. Yeah, there's a meetup this evening at 6:30, just around the corner, in uh, Frobisher Room Six. Um, I also have some flyers here for Wikimedia LGBT. We have a Facebook page and Twitter, and we're going to also have like a informal meet and greet at a bar later this evening. So, um, on the media, uh, the Wikimania Wiki, you can go to LGBT Meetup for more information about what we're doing this evening. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. You get someone else now.
Kumusha bus, which took place in um, Ethiopia, and created a whole new project, which is called Project Louis, which will be a, an outreach to take place in September and is an outreach to um, to universities, five universities in Ethiopia. Um, at Wiki Entrepreneur is currently taking place in Malawi and um, and Ethiopia as well, and Wiki loves monuments in South Africa as well as in other countries. And uh, School of Open is a collaboration between uh, Creative Commons and um, the School of Open in Uganda and uh, no, sorry, in Kenya and Nigeria, and it's just been announced and South Africa. And um, Open Africa and Open Africa Toolkits is a Wiki Africa project that we are doing um, that basically brings all of the open movements in very easy to understand toolkits that then lead off to the bigger spaces. So it was a way of allowing an easy introduction to the greater movement so that people then can then explore at their world but in a, a, a supported space. And Share Your Knowledge is the GLAM um, project that is throughout Africa at the moment. So um, that's pretty much a nutshell. I know that in Uganda there is also another project, um, which I, is a village project, which is an inspiring one. And there are other projects that are happening across. In Nigeria, I know that there are people who are very interested in starting um, user groups. So it's a big space that we're working with. And one of the biggest um, things that has happened this year so far is that Wiki Media South Africa and Wiki Africa work together to, uh, to bring Wikipedians from across Africa in the first ever continental um, gathering um, conference, which happened, it's called Wiki in Daba, and it happened in Johannesburg in June. Um, it was three days in Johannesburg. We had 39 delegates and 18 countries. So it was quite representative of um, the different countries from Africa. There were, of course, Florence was from France, and we had Orlando, we were from Italy. Italy. Yeah. Um, but the majority was from Africa, and it was very inspiring to see people who are very, um, who are both very experienced, as well as relative newbies, but people who have been involved, quite actively involved in the, in the open community. Yeah, I should mention as well that the uh, Wiki Nava event was funded by the Wiki Nava Foundation. And it was funded yeah. by the Foundation. Yeah. Um, so we are now on Kamusha Takes Wiki. So the idea behind Kamusha Takes Wiki is that it's a, it's a way of democratizing um, content, creation of content about Africa. So given the stats that um, that Bryce has talked about, it's the the amount of information that exists on Africa is very um, low, a very low veneer that's often skewed due to the system of bias that we all know. About. Um, and so one way of that we decided could change this is to empower communities who are actively on the ground in both Uganda and Cote d'Ivoire and encourage those communities to act, contribute, but to contribute on their level. So whether it's through photographs or whether it's about um, putting together a cookery book of um, Ugandan cuisine or whether it's but something that all contributes to the Wikipedia move through the Wikimedia movement and the sister projects. Um, so we approached funding, we got we were very grateful to get funding from um, from the Orange Foundation and we also got support funding from uh, Creative Commons and from uh, Prince Klaus to bring to run the training program, the Open Africa training program, that then resulted in the toolkit. Um, so what has been achieved? So we are, it is now active in um, Cote d'Ivoire and in, um, in Uganda. We went through a, a, an extensive recruitment process. We um, pre-launched at Hong Kong. We talked talk to a few people about it. Um, we did research into uh, extensive research into um, Uganda and Cote d'Ivoire, into both on wiki um, information and off wiki as well. And then we established the criteria for the community selection. We trained, we brought people to Cape Town to train them um, and give them a crash course in uh, the open movement. They left slightly befuddled but um, inspired. Um, as far as your on wiki and off wiki research, um, Moses and Max Klein, who is currently in the room, he's there. He did some incredible um, 
created incredible information about actionable metrics that um, exist on uh, ballots in Uganda and, and Cote d'Ivoire and how they are represented in, on the Wikipedias. Um, all of his entire report is on, um, you can check this out, we're going to put it onto the pad, um, this, this presentation, and you'll be able to use those links to um, go through his really thorough and amazing um, analysis of the data over the year. Um, and then Moses Klein, who is a, an academic in Cape Town, he worked on um, fine on off wiki stuff, so the information that currently exists across Africa online. So it was mas mostly online, but where the information about those countries sits. So um, is it just in, in governmental organizations? And so the ways that we can try and extract that the distinguish, the distinguishment idea behind this is the problem of sources, which we know is a major issue in Africa. So the idea was also to identify which sources we could already use yeah. and make sure that we have them by hand. So since they've returned to um, to their countries, respective countries, Arena and um, and Syriac have been working in different, many different areas. So they have communicated with the communities, they've established the, the main points people, they've um, talked about uh, the kinds of um, activities they've discussed and workshop the kinds of activities that, that we can do together. Um, and so there have been mapping parties, there's been training sessions with universities and communities, there's been trips to um, agricultural sectors um, and to heritage organizations. Um, and it's been quite a fascinating process. It is not without its challenges, I have to say, and working remotely with two different countries, um, and it's, it's a, a, a crash course in globalization and globalized communications. Just, just to give an example, with you, with one of the challenges we face, for example, you can't see on the picture on the top right, there's a desk, there is no computer on the desk. So one computer and the facilitator is basically in front of the computer and they work together, they are trained together um, out of no computer. So they decide to make together of an article, they write it together, but physically it's only one account editing it. So all the ideas we have behind tracking records of different users, number of apps, it's a difficult one. <laughs> and it, it is increasingly, and we, as we were discussing yesterday at the African Meetup, that actually a lot of people the number of edits are low because they edit the whole article and then they paste it onto Wikipedia. So even though they, they are, have 10 or 15 articles that they've created, there's one edit per article, or three maybe, to just polish it up a bit. So this, the, the skew for edits, it, to us, is quite, can be quite um, difficult. Um, and then just to give you an idea, the chosen communities, this is a run out of the chosen communities in Uganda, but we, we chose about seven equally similar communities in um, Cote d'Ivoire, and then, then chose some others that were specific. So there was a kind of idea about comparison, but also representing um, unique aspects of the culture. So it ranged, as you can see, it ranged from showing border towns so that there were conflict, those kind of areas of interest and conflict and, and layers of information and layers of access. Um, so that's the project we um, are running until, um, until January. We're looking for ways of extending it because we think it's important, it's an important project. We are also keen to extend it beyond the borders of the two countries that are currently um, processed. So if you have any, any ideas, I would be very get very keen. Um, and I think it's a great way of actively getting content as well as outreach. So it's not just stuck in, even though we have glands, it's a way of creating like a, a, a cross-cultural, cross-sector way of getting information about our country. And so I'm just supposed to carry on the Africa yeah. journey. Dur during this project, we thought that one of the good ways that we could have to talk about Wikipedia in African countries was to launch a photographic contest. So you all know about Wikilogs monuments, uh, there are others, Wikilogs Earth, and so on. So of course we thought at first, what about doing a Wikilogs monument over there, since 
so we've been done in South Africa and a couple of countries. Except that we found it was incredible, incredibly difficult to identify a proper uh, list of historical monuments in countries such as Ivory Coast or Uganda. So it was not the right path. So we decided to, to try to find uh, another way of doing it, and the idea is to hold an annual photographic contest, but every year the theme will change. And what we suggest is to try to have at, least at first some themes that might be very um, transversal, uh, very popular, so that everybody could quite easily participate. So the theme we have chosen for next, well, for this year, would be cuisine. Um, well, cuisine, well, because we cook um, first. That was an opportunity to go in the field, for example, to take some pictures of specific crops, and of course, maybe to edit articles about specific crops. Then to talk about, to start, uh, about objects, about dishes, maybe to uh, craft some recipe that we could post in our wiki books, uh, recipe book about Uganda or in Uruguay Coast or other countries. Uh, the idea was also to have the ability to take some pictures of marketplaces, for example. We might have some great pictures about it. And when you look at what is currently available in terms of pictures about most African country, right now it's basically landscape and animals taken by people who do safari photo, right? So we want to do some more well, life, life stuff. So the, 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 the concept of the project is that it will be run for the entire continent. It will be in October and November of this year and hopefully of uh, the following years uh, for two months. So we have, uh, we were all trying to do a, a sort of common platform in English and French, since it will cover at least most of African country. And the idea is to use this uh, with working with the local teams, such as the chapters already existing or the user groups, and have them also do locally some photographic uh, groups, uh, training sessions, whatever, and photo run, of course. So it will be open to everyone. Um, there we have already a whole bunch of countries which are interested in, in running this. So, for example, Botswana, Tunisia, Cameroon, and so on. So hopefully we will be at least a dozen countries where the contest will also have some local events taking place. So that's about the cuisine thing. And we would like to finish this presentation with to give you a little bit of an idea of the spirit of Africa. And for this, we have two videos to show you. These videos have been published about two weeks ago. They were um, pu pushed, the idea was pushed by Yolanda Panza from uh, Wallart, who has been working on Wiki Africa, and was produced by somebody who unfortunately was there yesterday, but left this morning. So we cannot show you the guy. It was from Cameroon. And the project was funded by the Wikimedia Foundation, but supported as well by the Orange Foundation, or Orange Company. I'm not sure. Uh, Orange company. The company? The company. Okay. So the idea behind this is to remind you that in many African countries, the Wikimedia Foundation managed to um, have this Wikipedia Zero thing. So who doesn't know anything about Wikipedia Zero? Just to make it shorty. The idea is that when you are a customer of the provider, you can access Wikipedia without the data being on your, on your uh, account. So it's a free access without data being removed from, from your account. So this has been started for the first time with Orange Company about, I think it was in 2010. Uh, and, and roughly, yeah. the, the first, the Wiki, Wikipedia, the first Wikipedia Zero thing. And now it's run in over 20 countries in Africa with many different internet providers. So I think that's part of the reason why these videos were made um, and what else can I do? Well, the idea is, is very simple. Contrary-wise to Europe and North Africa, Wikipedia is actually quite little known over there. So the idea was to make a little bit of a communication thing. So this is in French, but this is subtitled in English. But just, we're not sure whether the audio works at the moment. So if, so if there's messing around, I'm sorry. <laughs> Wikipedia, c'est quoi? Wikipedia.
Wikipédia. Et pas la nouvelle maladie là. Euh, franchement, désolé, votre fille est là, Wikipédia, donc euh, faut amputer. Ah oui, c'est la nouvelle maladie. Là. Mais non, Wikipédia, c'est une encyclopédie en ligne, utile, pratique et gratuite. Mais arrêtez de crier, madame, je n'ai pas Wikipédia. Et tu peux aussi accéder gratuitement à Wikipédia sur ta ligne orange en tapant www.wikipédia.org. <rire> Le premier point de disease, c'est la maladie, c'est le disease, et le second point, c'est la danse. Wikipédia, c'est quoi Wikipédia, Wikipédia... Ce n'est pas la nouvelle danse qu'on danse partout, là. Après le temps, pas la rue, on a fait la sauve, on a fait la bagarre, 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 on a fait la bagarre
So here's an overview, quick overview of things. Uh, last year there was a full panel uh, of discussion, yeah, discussion uh, related to Africa. Here it was just one session, so we had it. But if anyone has any questions, we've got about three minutes. Yes. And um, one of the staff actually mentioned quite a bit of a shortage in, on that same laptops or simply hardware to actually speak in English or in these countries. Now we're actually not providing them with pre internet access to make the zero, yet do we also do something to supply them with hardware laptops? I know there's an individual edit department. Which, which idea was to buy people with well, a very cheap level which could add a Wikipedia. Do we have any plans to do this in a large scale? So, yeah. I don't think that's our job, but we work with organizations, for example, such as OFPC. They are also the, 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 the Kiwix project, yes. and the Kiwix project also does <coughs> stuff with the computers. Are there some people knowledgeable about this? About providing computers? I think there are programs in some places. So I know in Tanzania there was one laptop on child kind of thing, and I think there was a there's an attempt in South Africa to provide um, tablets to children. That's, but, that's, that's the answer to this session. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, I think that there definitely are things that are happening, but just to correct you, that um, we're not providing free internet access. It's just on the mobile phone. It's zero rated data for the app. And it's the thing, the, where it doesn't work, I mean, essentially, the potential in Africa sits in the mobile phone because we are never going to crack that laptop story. You know, it's just, it's a billion people. So, <laughs> you know, that's a huge undertaking for anybody. Project last year in Cameroon set up a space, a physical space, yeah, where yeah, people can yeah. upload the images. <coughs> So that exists, but that doesn't mean they, they can't go there and edit it properly in the time. So the, the secret relies in the mobile application so that people can edit from their mobile. So I just heard from Adalia and she said that yes, uh, so it was a recent thing that Wikipedia Zero is available to all, uh, sorry, all Wikipedias are available to anyone who has access through Wikipedia Zero, um, but they're migrating the, the, some of the older contracts to the new version. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, no. It was first. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I just have a question about uh, we said we want to expand to all countries. Uh, what exactly do you need in order to expand? Sorry? So what we need was asking what, what do we need? need to do to expand to the other countries. Yeah. So our choice was to keep up some of the things there, so all the world of the state and the possible. Be possible to find some of the old areas. And I can tell you that that was a challenge, right? And get this person to a full time, all the time, by the way, so that they can organize those some units. So, what we need is essentially money to pay to the provider. Um, having a great deal to go behind some training sessions, so we can do some business training, but we need to have the people at least together, at least be present together, or at least have a few weeks of four weeks. Training with the and then hopefully what happens is that they need um, to be able to organize some sessions. Uh, grant students, they need to have some for free, but most of the time they have some travels to do, so they have a little bit of options. So we have to organize them That would be the main one. The extension of this is that they might have some sessions available um, when they need to come to the for example. It might be cool to have a place where you can put those photos, but that's not necessarily in my hand. It's all in my hand. Uh, but then she Yeah, if there's time. Uh, this will be the last question. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm curious about your opinions, or really anyone's in the room. Um, there's been some talk about how we present the Wikipedia front page, how we present those portals. Right now, if you go to English, it's all articles about like warships and battles in the US and the UK. And 
Um, and there's not a list of African languages, and there's not maybe articles that um, people might really find know. interesting if they're not interested in battles in the UK. So how do you feel about that? Like, I think it would, I'm just curious. I think it would remarkably change the landscape if, if you had an article that was relevant to the people who are accessing Wikipedia from each country. I don't think it has to necessarily be about like, you know, the government of Malawi as such, if you're accessing from Malawi, but I do think that if, if changes featured articles from, or even good articles from Malawi would actually completely change how people, I think a lot of people don't, they, they land on Wikipedia and they use it as an encyclopedia, which is right, but they also don't feel that it's relevant for them because they don't see themselves reflected in it, so, or their own heritage or their own understanding of, of their world. And I, I can't imagine that it's a huge problem to do. I mean, I, you know, if you know what I mean, if it, even if it was just Wikipedia Zero, the, the front page and the feature article <coughs> changed according to your IP address, mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, but it would really make, I think it would make a big difference in how Wikipedia is seen, not as a, as a European Western tool, but as a local kind of relevance. I think that would really help. But what, I don't know what other people think. They have more questions. I, I, I think there's... If you can ask, please come and ask us anything after, after the, this next session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, 
because, yeah, we have a diversity problem, and yes, I don't know it's Wonder Woman. How Batman says, I can have a Batman smashing the patriarchy. <laughs> um, so the idea has always been like one-off editathons, one-off workshops. Um, you know, you go do a dog and pony show, to steal Colonel's phrase, um, you know, at an institution show, look, we can get 50 people to show up. And then none of them ever come back. You know, we go to an institution and teach scientists how to edit, and none of them ever edit again. You know, we, we get 50 people to show up at a university library, and we waste all of our time and all of our teaching skills on teaching people who are never going to come back. So what we wanted was a program that would develop both editors and content. Um, and we did it, which is awesome. Um, we have way higher than the 0% retention rate, which is the best that anybody really has managed to do. Um, we had a 35% retention rate after the first set. Yeah, I, know. <laughs> I saw a couple of like, faces. Yeah, I'm, yeah, 35% rounded slightly because now, um, which is fantastic. So the pilot program, um, if you go to WP colon SBK, because I finally made a shortcut, um, you can see the results from our pilot program. You can also download a copy of the booklet, which will be available to get in the mail from a foundation near you, uh, hopefully very, very soon. Um, and they will look like these booklets. They're very cool. Um, so the booklet contains everything that you need to run a series of workshops with the ones that we did. So let me just give you a little background on what we did at Loyola um, under the IEG pilot. So we ran seven workshops. Um, I did not sleep much, but each workshop followed a really similar pattern. They were always in the same place, always at the same time. Um, we generally had the same food because, you know, I'm, I'm not kidding. We, we iterated every step of this process. So we went from first semester, we had workshops where no one showed up because we advertised the wrong way. That was really miserable and sad. Um, we had workshops where we had way too much food. Um, so we learned that when you order catering from an Arabic restaurant, you have to be very specific about what 10 to 15 people means. Um, because as it turns out, different cultures have different ideas of how much 10 people can eat. Um, you know, we, we ordered food and we thought it would be, you know, a couple of catering trays. We had like 15 catering trays. And I ate falafel, I'm not kidding, for like eight weeks. I, it, was, it was bad. Um, so we learned a lot about what drives people to workshops, what drives people to come back to workshops, hint, it's pizza and t-shirts. As we found, we get people there and they bring them back. Um, we rewarded repeat participants, so we allowed them to participate in raffles, we gave them all sorts of fancy Wikipedia swag, which like, we in the movie are like, oh, another Wikipedia t-shirt? No, 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 people think that they're the coolest thing. And they will wear them everywhere and post selfies on Facebook. And people will be like, where did you get that? And then they'll tell them. And that's how the idea spreads. It's really powerful. It's way more powerful than we think it is. Um, and one other thing that made our pilot successful was that it was an in-community thing. It was by women, and it was mostly for women. Um, out of 30 unique participants that we had over the semester, which doesn't sound like much, and I'll get to that, um, all but two were women. And I feel kind of bad for the guys for the like, dudes to show up because they felt like really uncomfortable being a minority. Which is a nice change for most Wikipedia events. Um, we also focused on women scientists because that's my pet project. Um, and because there was a group at Loyola that we could tap into, um, a group focused on women in science and math. Um, so we tapped into that social network, we tapped into that interest group, and we were able to create something uh, that really never had done before, a program that created a massive amount of content. We created 50 new articles that weren't just one-liner stubs. They all could have qualified for did you know if we had bothered. Um, and we improved over 30 of our articles, which is a pretty significant impact when you're only looking at 1,500 to 2,000 articles. So we discovered several elements of a successful program, and this is really what I'm, this is really what I'm getting at. Like if you want to run a successful program, you need at least these elements um, in order to make people come and care. It's really the care that matters. So the first thing you need is invitation culture. And we Wikipedia have had this idea for years that if you build it, they will come. And we're starting to run out of those people who will come just knowing that there's this thing out there. So it turns out if you tell people, so <laughs> the worst workshop we ever had, uh, my roommate came, and 
And that was about it, which was really, really sad because I had to coerce that roommate to come. And I told her that she would only get to share the leftover pizza if she showed up. Um, I, I went home and cried. Um, and it was miserable. And once I was done being miserable with myself, I thought about what had made that successful. And it turns out that you know, just putting up flyers, putting up posters, and telling people that an event exists, no one cares, especially on a college campus and in a lot of institutions. Um, at you know, health institutions, hospitals, you know, universities, you get a million invitations a day. What's going to make you care is a personal invitation. So we use word of mouth, which started out as me coercing friends and ended up with those friends coercing other friends and those friends coercing their own friends and creating a social network of people who wanted to come to these events and who cared about these events in an emotional way because their friends were dragging them along. And that's kind of counter to what we've been thinking in Wikimedia. Um, we tend to poo-poo the social side of things. But when you tap into people's social networks and make people drag their friends along, yeah, I had one friend who I, you know, strong-armed into coming, who enjoyed it, and then the next time I dragged three of her friends along, you have to come, you have to come. And they all stay through the whole series of workshops. That's something that you don't see very often. Um, and we found that social media also will drag in people who you don't know. Find Facebook groups of people in your area and invite them person. We want you to come. We are interested in your perspective. You are important to us. We want to talk to you. You know, talk to people personally. Um, send <coughs> personal invites. That makes people feel like they are wanted and they are welcome and that they're not intruding. And this is especially important for women um, because uh, what I found is that <coughs> women are scared to participate and they're scared to jump in on the whole. I've had everyone that I've ever taught, am I allowed to do this? Like literally they have asked me four or five times, am I allowed to create an article? Am I allowed to add a reference? Like, yes, 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 that's the whole point of you being here. You know, are we really allowed to? Um, so you don't want to make people just allowed to do it. You want to make people want to do it, care about doing it, and welcome to do it. Um, so the second element is food. You really have to, you have to feed people to take care of your participants, and you have to give them some other motivation than just the sheer altruism of the now, I go to a Jesuit school uh, It's incredibly social justice focused, but every single sign in our university is, there is injustice somewhere, let's fix it. Um, but injustice somewhere is not enough to bring you know, everyone to your event. So if people take care of them, give them swag, get everything will be well. Um, so the third element really connects to education culture, and that's social learning. You need to connect with your participants. If you stand up in front of them, like I'm doing right now, I'm sorry, it's really boring, um, and yammer out at them about the five pillars of Wikipedia and how to make a reference and blah, 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 everyone will hate you, no one will stay, and then you have a failure on your hands. Um, and we tend to think that that's an okay model because we are tech types, right? We like to sit and listen to people tell us things and take notes and sit, you know, and type on Twitter, and that's just not what works especially not for people who are highly social, which is really what we're getting at here, right? So, instead of having me or an Wikipedia stand up and blah, 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 we sit down one-on-one -on -one with people. So, it doesn't sound like we made a huge impact because we only have 30 people, the 30 unique people, most of whom are, you know, I, I, sorry, I'm trying to remember a second, 11, 11 of whom came to all or most of those workshops. Um, out of those 30 people, we had, you know, 9, 10, 11 at each workshop. And that's about the max that one person can handle. If you think that you can teach 50 people that I would like in one day, you are lying to me, or you are the flesh. I'm not sure which. Um, what we found was that sitting down with someone, and walking them through step by step, and smiling at them, and saying, you know, hello, what's your major? What do you do? And cracking jokes about whatever you crack jokes about. And, um, in our case, sharing in the feminist rage of, oh my god, I can't believe that she had to you know, show up and yell at these people, or oh my god, she had six children and was a pharmacist and a doctor, and you know, like just sharing it. Oh my god, her name was Icy. Who names their child Icy? Like just little stuff like that. Creating connections, having fun, and allowing yourself to be a little silly really makes the difference. And the benefit of social learning, if you sitting down, if I sit down with three friends who come and teach one of them how to make a reference, they won't call me back to corner and do that ever again. 
one will teach the next will teach the next. Because we like to teach each other and we like to share skills that we've just learned. So that also brings investment, right? If you enjoy learning, you get to teach your friends and acquiring a new skill is like really satisfying. Mastering it and getting to teach it to someone else is like crack for people, right? So that element of the social learning environment is really important for retention. Talking to people does not work. Talking with people and talking in concert with people, not at the same time because that's stupid, um, is really what brings people back to their thoughts. So another element of that is personalized and personable teaching for an institution or for a group. So you know what makes your group tick. I don't know what makes your group tick. I cannot tell you know, one of you what's going to work in your community because you know. You know the subject matter that people in your area care about. You know that if you have a you know, classic car <coughs> interest group, and you could get them to write about classic cars on Wikipedia, I couldn't do that because I don't know what, you know, I, I, that's not my area, I don't care about that. But if you know that and you know what motivates those people, what makes them care, you can create a more personalized teaching style that focuses on the things that those people care about. You know, if I go to a group of feminists at uh, uh, Loyola and say, guys, guys, all of these women scientists are being ignored, and this is an injustice, and girls won't know about women scientists, and blah, blah, blah. They'll be like, right, I'm angry, let's do stuff. But if you said that to you know, a bunch of classic car collectors, they'd be like, OK, but yeah. But they wouldn't have the same, let's do stuff. But if you said, wow, your favorite car doesn't have an article, let's do stuff, right? you got to get the let's do stuff attitude, which is what I mean by personalized teaching. You can use this model, but you have to make it yours. You have to know what works for your area, what makes people angry. Think about that. Um, and that really ties into the narrow topic area. You have to pick the one thing that's, that's fixable, that you can show real progress in, that will make people motivated, and make them angry, and put to contribute in, the, in a constructive, non trollish way out of their anger. Um, I keep saying, you know, make people angry. I don't mean make them go troll on Wikipedia like, urgh, feminism, urgh, cars, urgh, whatever. <laughs> That's also not productive. The goal is to channel, you know, if people are upset about injustice or they're upset about their favorite Pokemon not getting a fair shake on Wikipedia or whatever, you can fix that. Empower people to fix what they care about and you will have successful workshops. Um, <laughs> So I want the evil of um, systemic bias to be defeated, right? I want Wikipedia to represent all people, all cultures, all viewpoints, all whatever you care about, right? Um, so after this pilot program, we don't just want me to keep doing these workshops, right? So we are seeding programs all around the world to do something similar at different institutions with different focuses, you know, and different emphases. We're also translating. So I want this program in as many languages, and I speak three languages sort of well. Um, so if you speak another language and you're interested in seeing this in your community, help translate these materials. It's like 3,000 words. It's not a ton, right? It is totally doable. Um, so we're thinking of getting partners for translation. So you could be the next individual engagement contractor type person. That would be awesome. Um, we're also training the trainers, right? We want to teach people how to use these workshops in a hands-on way so that people have the confidence to use these skills and create these series of workshops in their own institution without just me talking at them for half an hour. Um, because as we found, talking to people doesn't always create change, it often creates more people. Um, and if you are interested, please speak to me. We can talk. Um, so we're also I really can't grammar today, but um, we're trying to improve what needs to be taught to each, each institution. So the more programs that we have running, the more we will know what is mutable and what needs to stay in order for this to be a successful program. Because it turns out that not every kind of group loves food, which I can't really imagine, but okay, then that's something that we can say you may or may not need this. But we want to know what exactly, like, we want to distill down to the most essential elements of this so that anybody, anywhere, can pick this up and create a successful program, create editors, and create content. Um, and we also want to engage with non-university institutions. 
we've pretty much figured out what makes college students tick. Again, pizza and rage. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not kidding. College students are so easy to make angry. Um, <laughs> it's the truth. It's the truth. Um, but you know, what makes people at you know a health institution angry? It's probably much different than what makes college students angry. It probably takes you know a lot more. So we need to explore that. So if you are interested, this is my call to you. If you are interested, if you want these kinds of programs, if you want to see people consistently coming to your program, if you want to really create impact on content and on the editor community in your area, talk to me. Uh, you know, go to the Systemic Bias Kit. Look it up, check it out, and we will teach you. So that's all of me talking at you. How about you talk at me? appreciate uh, your uh, school skew bias workshop yeah. templates. I, th I think there are like 11 pages of PDF yes. online and uh, we were using that for the hackathon in, in Hacking Day in Taiwan. Oh my god, that's awesome. So, sorry, I didn't read. You should have told me. <laughs> 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 hey. We were discuss that uh, for, 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 for a little bit and uh, yeah. they, there, there were scientists in Academia Sinica. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, yeah, it was fun. Uh, so so uh, just want to let you know now. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> and uh, uh, I'm also wondering, uh, so in that template, yeah. there's a, like a one page handout yes. that you show. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, is, uh, do, do you print that uh, every time, or uh, 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 and uh, if there's people they, that uh, doesn't bring the laptop, mm -hmm. uh, how, how would you uh, make them to do something? Yeah, so those are problems that we've run into a couple times. Um, so when people don't bring their laptops, that's really sad because mobile editing is not quite at the level where we can add references <laughs> easily and it requires a lot of working code and it's kind of a pain in the ass. Um, so at our university, we've come up with a solution where we rent laptops and we rent tablets from our library, which offers a program like that. Obviously, that's going to be institution specific. You know, if you personally have two machines and you can rent one for people to use as a loaner, that, that helps. Um, we also put on all of our stuff. Every advertisement we put out, every call to action we put out, bring your laptop. Bring your laptop. Please, for the love of God, bring your laptop. Um, and that usually gets people to bring it. Um, yeah, your mileage may vary on that one. Um, and then the handout. We do print a handout every time. So we print the Wikipedia cheat sheet that's published. And then, so, so people don't have to ask like 18 times, how do I make a link? How do I make a link? How do I make a link? Um, you know, we tell them, hey, formatting things are on this sheet. Ask us if you have more questions, and they usually, you know, that, that's okay. Um, and then we do print out the handout. I would <coughs> suggest, so for those of you who haven't looked at, the handout contains an example of an article, um, because we write very specifically formatted articles every time that are kind of formulaic. So we show them an example of that, um, so they can follow along a lot better. That is something you're going to have to customize. So pick what you want your articles to look like, and then you know use our format to make that. Um, and we also walk them through the flow of how you know what, is, what do I start with? You know, that's always the first question. Like, well, when you're writing a biography, start with the name. Let's try that, and then, you know you go from there. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Cool. Thank you. More questions? Echoes? Comments? Yeah. yeah. I was wondering about the retention rate of the event. Yeah. Uh, how does it work for you uh, now in that time? And the events are still on the social media. And it's it's the it's the media. So oh. here's the deal. One out of 30 participants kept editing outside. And this provides a lovely opportunity for me to plug my pet theory about one Wikipedians and make Wikipedians. And I, poor Chris, has heard this theory like 8 million times. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the people, people sitting in this room are mostly born with computers, right? We would edit with no other motivation. We started editing with not a lot of motivation. Like, hey, this is cool. I can click edit. Like, what is this? Um, and then there are many Wikipedians who 
need an extra push. So we found through our workshops one more opinion, and she's a massive nerd. She would fit in really well in this room. Um, and if she's watching, hi, Liz. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, she's wonderful. She sits, like, I find her in the library writing articles on obscure botanists, like, all the time. Um, but that's really rare, right? With this, we're focusing on the population of people who will edit, given that extra push. They need the time and the space to edit. They need them on their schedule. They need food. They need you know social support. They need whatever it is that we're giving. You know, and I've, I've asked all of my participants this, like, you know, why do you edit here and no one else, or and you know, and nowhere else? And I've gotten a whole range of answers. So it's different for different people. Um, but we can engage a whole wider population if we let these main Wikipedians come to fruition. So, you know, I've had girls tell me, I edit because I like hanging out with you guys and editing is what we do together. So that's one answer. She never edits outside of her workshop. But when she's at a workshop, she'll write three or four and one go. Um, I've, literally, one girl has told me every single time I ask this question, I come because bread. Because we always buy Panera bread. And she really likes the bread, and damn it, that's why she talks. <laughs> and she never edits outside the workshops. You know, I had another girl tell me, you know, she just, you know, needs to make the time to do it, and this is the time that she makes. You know, so it's a range of motivations, and it's a whole population that we just haven't tapped into. So I guess that's my excuse for why the other retention rate is so low. You know, but when you have multiple editathons, you don't need people editing outside of them because they'll come back in two weeks and write three or four more articles again. So that's kind of our way of skirting that problem. Yeah. Uh, Ellen, did you, uh, did you ever receive support from your institution loyal, or had you had you attempted to seek support from them? So we spent a lot of time. We spent a lot of time fighting with Loyola uh, um, for other reasons, <laughs> mostly unrelated to this. They did not like the idea of us, you know, hanging out in a school building on Sunday eating pizza for some reason, or us taking books out of the library. But we ended up convincing people of getting a whole lot of institutional support. The library gave us, I'm the only person apparently in the school allowed to check out reference books because I begged a lot. <laughs> and they really nice to people and swore that we would never, ever, ever get pizza on it. And we never have. So fingers crossed. Um, and we ended up, we don't get funding from the school, although if you don't want to go through Project and Defense Grants like I've taught you, you can go through your institution if that funding is easier for you to get. Um, but they did end up acquiescing to our requests for space, and now they know us. So once your institution knows you, like, oh, it's going to be for the seventh time this semester, hey, here's what you want, you know, and they, and they know you and they're used to it. So, eh, is the answer, or okay. TLDR answer. Um, so I think, am I out of time? Yeah, yeah it's just if you want to take a question. Okay, if anybody else has questions, I'll answer to them. I'm also hanging around, so. Thank you guys. Thank you.
post moment. So yeah. Say all? Yeah. Okay. Was it all in here? Yeah, it's all in here. <laughs> <laughs> you should have gone for the cute animal. <laughs> you should have gone for the cute animal, yeah. <laughs> You're making a mistake. Part three. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah.